Uh, we're going to go through some of the concepts around Google Earth Engine API for Python. The Google Earth Engine uh, offers two different APIs, one for JavaScript and another for Python. The JavaScript API is quite mature. That was the offered at the beginning. And both APIs kind of do the same thing. But And many people use Earth Engine from the JavaScript API. Lately, most people are interested in using the Python API because your workflows are in Python. You want to do everything else in Python. Why do we use Earth Engine with JavaScript. So we'll learn how to use Earth Engine with your Python code and what are the special features that the Python API offers in addition to what JavaScript does. Python API was kind of ignored by Google for a long time. But lately, they are investing heavily into making the Python API as good as possible and bringing it at par with the JavaScript API. So you'll see now even in the documentation, all the code snippets will have both a JavaScript version and the Python version. So let's learn about the basics of the Earth Engine Python API. To use the Python API, you have to install a package called Earth Engine-API. In Python, you have some core packages that come with the Python language. If you want to install, if you want to use something else, you have to install a package. This package is available via pip and conda, what the two main places how the Python folks install packages, and you can install that in your environment. The advantage of using Python is that Python is supported across so many different languages. Python is supported across so many different environments. So you don't have to go to code editor and use Earth Engine. You can say, I'm doing all my work in a notebook environment. I can use Earth Engine there. I don't have to go to a different place. If you say, I'm building some scripts that run on a server, you can run Earth Engine code on the server. You don't have to use a code editor. If you're building an app using a web framework, or maybe you're using Flask or Django and you're building your apps, you want to integrate Earth Engine within that, well, you can use that. There are many examples of, you know, Earth Engine API being used across different web frameworks. We're going to see some examples of that. You can also use the Earth Engine API within QGIS. So if you want to query and display the data from Earth Engine within QGIS, you can do that as well. And same goes for any environment that supports Python. So anywhere you can run Python, you can run Earth Engine. And that gives you a lot of flexibility. If you want to build apps, the JavaScript API provides you with a very easy way to create web apps, but it's also quite restricted if you want to export some data. So I want to allow people to export entire images. I don't want to be restricted to the 32 megabyte that is restricted by the Earth Engine apps. Or I want to use some layout which is not supported by the JavaScript API. Using Python, you can do virtually anything. So you have the entire power of Python. You can create any layout. You can integrate other charts. You can say, I don't like how Earth Engine creates charts. I want to use my own charting library. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and freedom. I'm going to show you some of the apps that people have created using Earth Engine. similar to how you use the JavaScript API to create app very easily using the widget. In Python side, there's a library called Streamlit, which many data scientists use. Streamlit has an integration with the Earth Engine Python API, so you can build apps that run on Streamlit. This is an example of an app that does a lot of interesting things. It allows you to take create a time lapse for any region and use it powered by Earth Engine. So you can see this app doesn't look anything like your Earth Engine app but it is using the Earth Engine API in the background. The way it works is you, there's a demo here. You can see the demo, watch the video. I already have, if you have a shape file or a GeoJSON for some region, you can upload that. I have a GeoJSON for this region, so I'm just gonna upload that. So let's say I have a bounding box and you can create an animation just using this app. So let's say I want to create using the Landsat data and I can click submit. And now this request is going to Earth Engine. Earth Engine is saying, okay, I need to create this image collection, I need to colorize it, I need to create an animated GIF or uh, MP4 file, and it will be displayed here. This kind of stuff is very hard to do on the Earth Engine site. Uh, again, you can create this very interesting layouts, which are again restricted on the JavaScript side. This takes a while to learn, so I've ran it a little bit before, and it's you can see once it's run you can see you have an animation that looks like this this is a 40 year time series of this particular region you can right click and save this as a gif file 
So again, you can build apps which are very interactive and, and have any different layout. We'll see, and again, supported across different web frameworks. So why do we want to use Python API? Well, it has some additional features like automation. So if you want to run some script on a schedule, let's say every Monday morning at 6 a.m., I want to run this export and get data for the previous week. I don't want to wake up at 6 a.m. every Monday morning and run, click the run button. I want it to be happen automatically. So Python API can allow you to do this without you being there. You can just schedule a job using Python. Batch processing. I want to download 10,000 images. Or I want to, I have an app where the user clicks on a button, it starts some exports. I want to kind of integrate and automate all this stuff. How do I do this? Well, you can use the Python API, which is, offers you additional features to control and launch exports automatically. If you're doing any sort of deep learning, we saw that Earth Engine offers you an API for doing machine learning. But deep learning, if you're using PyTorch or TensorFlow, you want to run those models with Earth Engine data. Earth Engine Python API offers a way to integrate both, so you can use that. And lastly, it just says, if you are using Python everywhere else, it makes sense for you to use Python. You are a team of data scientists, everybody's using Python. You don't want to be the only person using JavaScript. If you use Python, you can integrate with other workflows. And let's say you have, everybody's creating charts using a favorite charting template. You want to use the same for Earth Engine charts and using Python API allows you to do this. And of course you can use any web framework that supports Python and use Earth Engine with that. So main challenge for kind of custom web apps in Earth Engine is authentication. There's a section in the user guide that explains the authentication steps that you need to use. Once you figure this out, everything else is just a regular Python call. So any regular Python code that works within that app framework, you can use Earth Engine API. We mentioned that the JavaScript and Python API are identical, but it's nearly identical. There are some differences. Mainly everything in the EE module is available. So if you use e.image, e.feature collection, e.list, all of those are available. So if you use, if your code uses that, that code will remain identical. You will still not use any of the Python stuff there. So if you want to create a list and remove some item, you'll not use Python methods. You'll just say e.list and then dot remove, right? So all of those stuff stays the same. All the e models are available. For Earth Engine, JavaScript API, for exports, you have export image to drive or export table to drive. On the Python side, you have ee.batch.export image to drive. So ee.batch is a new module that's not available in JavaScript. It has got some additional features where you can start an export without clicking. You can also delete an export. You can check the status of the export and so on. So this is a special module that's available in Python API, which allows you to control the exports much better. You have additional methods that are available in the Python API where Instead of getting image or is getting some feature collection, you can directly get an array. You can get a NumPy array directly from Earth Engine. This is super helpful where you would say, I, I am writing some code. I just want some array well, from this pixels. So you can call e data get pixels, will query Earth Engine, and you'll just get an array back from Earth Engine. So this allows it to be much tightly integrated with Earth Engine, with Python workflows. And anywhere you can use a NumPy array in Python, you can use this call and get data from there. Notably, there's no UI module. Remember UI is a client side module. So UI.chart is not there. Other UI widgets are not there. So you don't have built-in support. There are third-party modules. We'll learn how to do this. So third-party modules offer all the support for you know, adding a map and creating charts and creating apps and so on. But the API itself doesn't offer any functions for creating charts or apps. How to use Python API? The easiest way to use the Python API is using Google Colab. Colab is a hosted Jupyter Notebook platform that Google offers free of cost. You can go to this website. You'll get an environment where you can run some Python code. It comes pre-installed with the Earth Engine API. So you don't have to install anything. You just start using this. This is the closest you can get to like a code editor experience that you can just go to a website and start using the Earth Engine API. The one downside of Python is that every time you run this, you have to authenticate. So the authentication, when you do authentication, you get a token that is saved on the computer where you're running this from. 
If you're running this on your own computer, this is a one-time process forever. So you install Earth Engine, you authenticate, and you're set. In Colab, every time you open a new tab, you get a new machine. And once you close the tab, that machine goes away. It just gets wiped out clean, and you get a new machine next time. That's why you have to authenticate every time. It's a bit painful. There are some workarounds to this, but for, you know, right now, the only official way to use this is you have to authenticate every time, which is a bit painful. Other way you can install, use Python API is just install Python package on your machine. So install Python on your computer, install the Python API, and then you can start using this. We have step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. It requires some configuration of the cloud authentication parameters and your Earth Engine parameters. If you want to install and configure the Earth Engine API, we have step-by-step -step instructions. Go ahead and read that so you can install and run Python. For this course, you don't need to. We'll use Colab, which avoids the need for any local installation or local configuration. We're going to cover different stuff in the module first. We'll learn about the Earth Engine API syntax. This is very similar to our module one, Hello World script, where we just learn what are the different stuff you need to learn about JavaScript. How to define a list, how to define variables and so on. And what's the difference from the JavaScript stuff? So you understand that I have some JavaScript code. I want to convert it to Python. What changes do I need to make? And we'll also get our first hand experience with doing some Python work with our Engine API. Once we do this, we'll learn that there is a package called GE map which allows you to automatically convert any JavaScript code to Python. You don't even have to know the difference. Say, paste your JavaScript code, click a button, you'll convert everything to Python. So again, or once you learn this, you can take any of our scripts from our course or you find anywhere on the internet, paste it, and you'll get the Python version of that. And you can do this because the difference is mainly syntactic. There's no Python or JavaScript specific stuff you're doing. You're using the API and the difference in the API is very minor and that can be automatically converted. You learn how to do batch exports, how to use the e.batch module to automatically start exports, stop them or start hundreds of exports together. We learn how to do this. We'll also learn how to integrate Python with the rest of the Earth Engine with the rest of the Python, Python ecosystem. There is a new module called XEE allows Earth Engine and X-Array to interoperate together. X-Array is how remote sensing people do work with Python. So if you are using Python and you're doing remote sensing, you are using X-Array. So say I'm using X-Array, how can I get data from Earth Engine into my X-Array workflow? I will learn how to do this. And this allows you to say, I have my workflow, I can integrate Earth Engine within that and we'll learn about the way to do this. Will all of this, we have a notebook each notebook has an exercise that will go through and learn how to do this. After that, we have some demos. These are more advanced workflows where we don't have exercises, but we'll demonstrate how to use this and do this with Python API. How to automatically do downloads. Every Monday morning, I want to run the script. How do I set it up? How do I set up a service account? How do I schedule this job? We'll do a demo of that. We'll see how to use Earth Engine from QGIS, how to leverage the cartographic capability of QGIS to create maps from Earth Engine directly without exporting and downloading data. You can just use the plugin to do this directly. We'll also do a demo of doing deep learning with Earth Engine. We'll take our supervised classification and build a deep learning model. So we can now use TensorFlow and build a deep neural network to predict and classify the image into the class. And we'll see the difference between how a classical machine learning with random forest compares with a deep learning model and we'll see that how to do this using Earth Engine. So with that, let's get coding. A note for people who don't know Python. Similarly, how I mentioned that if you don't know JavaScript, it doesn't matter. I'll teach you everything you need to know about JavaScript. Similarly, if you don't know Python, that's okay. We'll go through and teach you the, how the environment works and how the basic syntax works so you can use Earth Engine from Python. But if you are a Python user and you are an expert in Python, you'll find ways to integrate Earth Engine in your regular workflow as well. All the code is linked, is available in notebooks, which is on this URL. So let's go to this URL. On this URL, we have the module six, which has got the, all the code notebooks linked here. So from this, we find module six. And each section has a link to open a notebook in Google Colab. So let's start with our first notebook and you can click this link to open the Colab notebook. So all the scripts 
from this module are linked from this section. As we go through and work on different notebooks, you'll find the links to those notebooks in this section. I'm going to share the link to this collab notebook directly here. So this is the first notebook that we are going to work on now. When you open this link, if you see the URL, you'll see that this script is coming from my GitHub repository. Similar to how an Earth Engine repository works, you do not have write access to it. So you cannot modify this script. It's my script I've shared with all of you. So you can read it, but you cannot change it. Since you're going to be making changes to this and saving this, the first step here is to make a copy of this notebook into your own drive. Colab is a part of Google Drive. So whatever changes you make and save the script, they'll go into your Google Drive. So let's copy this to our drive. So go to file and say, save a copy in drive. Open a new tab. The URL should have drive in it. And that means it's your own copy. So at this point, it's uh, you made a copy. It's in your drive. Whatever changes you make will be automatically saved. And you can share and do something with it. So you made a copy of that. A bit a brief introduction to Colab. Colab is a hosted platform. That means you can run Python code on a machine that is running in Google Cloud. Every time you start a new session, you will get a new machine. So first step would be to click this button connect. So if I say connect, it's going to go and find me a new machine that is available for me to run some code in Google Cloud. Every time I start a new session, I'll get a new machine. This will be like a brand new machine where they've installed Linux and you have a fresh environment that you can work on. It. So you can see I have now connected to a Python 3 Google Compute Engine backend. If I hover over it, you'll see that I have a machine which has got 12 GB of RAM and 100 GB of storage. It's a pretty good machine. So if you want to do deep learning, if you want to do some analysis, you now have a free machine in Google Cloud that you can do your work on. So if you have an old laptop, don't do Python work here. Do it on Colab. You have this really nice free machine that you can use. If you're doing deep learning, you can also connect to a GPU. So if you want to build a deep learning model and train them, you can connect to a GPU backend, which is also freely available. So that allows you to use a graphics unit in the cloud and train or predict your deep learning model. So now we have a machine. This machine allows us to run some Python code. So first, we're going to import the Earth Engine API. The Earth Engine API package is already installed, so I can just call this function and run this cell, import EE. In the notebook environment, you have the cells which are have some bit of code, and they are meant to be run one after the other. So you run this bit of code, it's run. Now we run the next code. Before you do any work with Earth Engine, you have to tell Earth Engine that what is your account and what is a cloud project that you want. You don't have to do this with the code editor. It's kind of configured behind the scenes. When you use the Python API, you have to do this. You have to initialize and authenticate the project. In your code editor, if you come and look at on the right side, it'll show you what's the name of your project. It'll give you this button project info. And whatever it shows here, the cloud project name, this is the name that you want to use here you have to change this to be your own Earth Engine project. So go and find this in your code editor. On the right-hand side, if you click your account ID here, it'll show you the project and whatever project you've been using with Earth Engine, if you click on project info, the name of the project is what you want to use here. For me, it's called Spatial Thoughts. For some of you, it might be ee dash, whatever your user ID, and that's what you want to use. So it's the first difference between the kind of initialization of your API. You have to specify a cloud project here and then click run here. It's going to say, we'll sign into your Google account. We'll say, allow this. It's going to go through this workflow. You have to run it and go through the things. And once it's done, you'll say, oh, I'm signed in. I have access to your Earth Engine account. And now I can run some Earth Engine API call. This has to be done every time in Colab. If you are running this notebook on your own computer, you don't have to do this. You just do once and your credentials are saved. You never have to authenticate again. But in Colab, since you get a new machine every time, you have to do this. Try both the cells on your side and see if you're able to do this. The so second one, make sure you replace the project with whatever it shows in your code editor and then run it. 
go through the authentication workflow. Once you see a green tick here, you're all set. Let's learn the basic syntax of Python and how to use Earth Engine API from Python. I have the JavaScript equivalent. So if you have already learned Earth Engine with JavaScript, I'll show you what to change in your JavaScript code to get the Python versions. When we are writing our scripts, we have to define variables. In JavaScript, we use var keyword. In Python, there is no var. So you can just define your variable just with the variable name. So here we are defining city and state variable. Print function remains the same. You can use the print function to print stuff. You can use the Earth Engine objects the same way you use that. So you can say e dot image collection. You can define geometries. All of that will continue to work. So I can run this cell and now my Python environment understands what is EE since we had imported and authenticated works. A few changes, for example, we are used to writing filters like this in the code editor. We can say S2 dot filter, dot filter, dot filter. So we can just apply multiple filters together using the dot operator. If you want to do the same thing with Python, you have to make a small change. In Python, you can't arbitrarily break lines at different places. JavaScript allows you to do that. In Python, if you want to break your code into multiple lines, you have to put this backslash character. The backslash character says, ignore the new line, let it continue. So if you want to break your code down multiple lines, you just have to replace this with backslash. And there are no semicolons. So remove the semicolons, add a backslash, and your code will work. So you can see now I can apply filters the same way, but I don't, if I omit this, I'll get an error. So if I don't write this, I'll get an error in Python. So that I, I doesn't work, right? So make sure if you're breaking your code over multiple lines, you have to put a backslash. Functions, in Earth Engine, you have to write a lot of your own functions. So you can map them in JavaScript. You use the function keyword. Here is a function that adds an NDVI band to an image. Here's a function for cloud masking. The same can be converted to Python. In Python, defining function requires a keyword def. Def is for define. So here, if I want to define a function called NDVI, I'll say def add NDVI, and then I can write code in between. So now I run this, the same code will work. I can take a collection, map functions over this. There's no change in the code that you write. There's change only in the syntax. No semicolons, no vars functions get replaced by def and your line continuation has a backslash character. So it's just superficial changes. So your code is compatible with the Python syntax. All the core stuff remains the same. The JavaScript API is smart enough where you can, instead of giving the parameters and by position, so you can say first one is this reducer, second is geometry. You can give a dictionary of parameters in JavaScript and it figures out what is the appropriate value for each parameter. And this is a recommended way to write your function parameters. It's more readable, easy to debug and so on. On Python side, same thing works, but you need to prefix this dictionary with double star. This is just a Python syntax to say, I'll give you a dictionary, convert them into keyword arguments. So Python functions require this double star prefix if you're giving arguments as a dictionary. Minor change. Rest, everything remains the same. You can continue to write this and your code will work. In a collab environment, if I want to write some new code, I can click this plus code button here. It'll add one code cell and I can print stuff. So let's say I've done some reduced region. I want to print the stats here. I print this and again, I don't get the value. I get some garbage. This is the same thing. This is an object that is there on the server side. It has not been computed yet. In the JavaScript side, we said there are two ways to do this. You can call dot get info or evaluate. Get info is synchronous. It will block your UI. So in JavaScript world, we always use evaluate. On the Python side, there's only one option, which is get info. If you want to print something, you also have, always have to do get info. It's not that big of a deal in Python because you're not building interactive apps. You are you know, running cell by cell. So when you run the cell, wait for it to be computed and you get the value. So you can see now we want to print. So all the print statements need a get info in the Python side. And that'll compute the value and then you'll see the actual value of the object. Another lesser known feature of the API is that you can, when you want to map something, 
you can map a function directly. So instead of writing a function first and then mapping it over a list or the collection, you can say, I want to map a function on this my list. I can say dot map and define the function right there. So this is called an inline function or an anonymous function. So this function doesn't have a name. Anonymous functions in Python need a Lambda keyword. So the same thing, you can say, I want to map a function. You have to use the Lambda syntax in Python. So here it says, take the number, return the square of the number. Use this. So if you have nest, if you have map functions, which are using inline functions, convert them to Lambda functions using the Lambda keyword. And that's it. That are the differences from JavaScript to Python. Once you know how to define variables, how to write code for line continuation and define a function using the def keyword, that's all the differences you need to know. And you can now convert any code from JavaScript to Python or write Earth Engine code in Python from scratch. Let's do an exercise. Now you can explain the exercise. So for the exercise here, you have this JavaScript code snippet where you have a geometry, you are having Sentinel-2 feature image collection, and you are filtering it for the geometry and the date. And we want to print size of the collection. So how many images it should have, it be printed. So you just need to convert this to be workable in Python. So you can copy this one and you can have a new code cell and paste it there and make changes here. So we want to convert it to Python. So just remove all the, all the vars, wherever we are defining new variable, you can use slashes for chaining and you need to, for printing, you have to use get info. So just apply all the changes and expected output should be value 30. So this should have 30 images in the feature collection. So size is 30. So try this one and you have to start with copying the notebook to your drive if you have not done it yet. If you're just starting the notebook with an exercise, make sure you run import EE, you run the second cell, replace the cloud project with your own cloud project and authenticate. And after that, you'll be able to run the Python code. Let's learn how to convert your JavaScript code to Python Earth Engine API code automatically. We learned in the previous section how to do it manually, line by line, removing certain things, but you can all do this automatically. So let's learn how to do this in our next script. When you're starting with a Colab notebook, always make a copy first. So we go to file, save a copy in drive. So let's make a copy. The EE package that Google has built has all the core functions. It's missing a few things. Notably, it doesn't have a map visualization. So if you want to see your results on a map, that API doesn't have. It doesn't have a way to explore the data catalog. It doesn't have a way to create charts and so on. So over time, there were other packages that were developed to fill in the missing functionality. One main package that is available for Earth Engine is called GEMAP. This was mostly developed by a single person, Professor Kui Sheng Wu. He has done amazing work in creating and maintaining this package. It's got a lot of features, one of the really helpful libraries to work with Earth Engine and Python. All of the users who use Earth Engine with Python must use this. This is a very vast library. Recently, the core part of GE Map has been merged with the, the main Earth Engine package, and that's maintained by Google. So not the full GE Map package, but the core part of GE Map, which gives you the essential features, are now maintained by Google. It's also pre-installed in your Colab. So if you are working with Earth Engine in Colab, the GMAP package comes pre-installed and allows you to do many useful things with Earth Engine API. So let's import this GMAP package and our Earth Engine API. If you run the cell for the first time and not connected to any backend, it'll give you a new machine and then we can initialize this. So we go through the same initialization workflow. GMAP offers you an improved authentication workflow where you don't have to sign in every time. That's not official. That's a, like a third party implementation. But if you're using Colab a lot with Earth Engine, check out the GMAP authentication module, which allows you to pre-save your authentication credentials and just reuse that without having to do this every time. When you get the GMAP, the GMAP has a map module. So you get a map where you can display your Earth Engine results. So let's create the map first. So we have a function here, gmap.map, and say we want map with, with 800. We save this into a variable called m, 
and collab environment in Jupyter environment, whenever you want to see the value of the variable, you have to name the value. So if you just say, I want to run the cell, say, okay, I've created a map and I've saved it into this variable called M, but I don't see any map. So if you want to see the map, you have to say, display this M variable. So in the new line, I just say M, it's going to display the value that is contained in the variable. So now when I see, I'll see a map. So you can see, I see a map. This map contains all the missing features that are there in the JavaScript API, but not in the Python. For example, if you click the settings button, you get an inspector. So I can now inspect. And when I click on a point, I'll get the light long, zoom level, scale, the same thing I get in the code editor. So this map will give you the interfaces that you are used to working with JavaScript API. You also get the drawing tools. So if you want to draw polygons or lines, you can use this here. One useful features that the GMAP map has is this button. It says automatically convert Earth Engine JavaScript to Python. So you can come here and paste any code, JavaScript code, and it converts to Python. Let's take this code. I have some JavaScript code, which is taking Sentinel to collection, applying some filters, creating median composite, and displaying this on the map. I can paste this here and I can click convert. And it gets converted to Python. You can see all the vars are gone, the semicolons are gone, you have line continuation characters, etc. I'm going to take this and say I want to now run this so you can add a new code cell and click paste. So now I have a Python equivalent of the code that I want to run. You can see it creates this, it's adding this M and adding this layer. But if you want to see the result, you have to add this M extra. So you just have to add this one character just to display the result. And now you'll see that this M has this composite that was created. So you have your Earth Engine imagery streamed in from the Earth Engine servers into your notebook. All the other things work. You can now run inspector and inspect the values. It'll show you the values that go you know, for that pixel. So now instead of using map.add layer, you have to say m.add layer, where m is the gmap map that we had created. So this is just a small difference that we had to create, where we create a gmap, use the built-in converter, and convert a code. And you can paste any code, it'll get converted. The caveat here is you, your code should only have the server-side functions. If you're doing some crazy client-side processing, that won't work. So that's JavaScript, you can't convert to Python. So as long as you maintain best practices, but not using any client side stuff, do all the processing using server side functions, all of that gets converted. There could be cases where you want to convert your code using code. So you say, I want to write some script. I have my JavaScript file stored somewhere. I want to automatically convert to Python. I don't want to manually copy paste it. If you want to do automatic conversion, there's another function that's available with a G map where you can take some JavaScript code, create this, you know, paste it here and save it into some variables. So right now we have a variable called JavaScript code, which contains our JavaScript code. And the G map also gives you a function, JS snippet to Py. And you can say, I have this code saved in this variable, convert it into Python. And if I run this script, you'll see that I get the full script in Python. And I can copy this, open a new cell and run this. And now this is going to create, run this code in Python and I'll see the result. Just missed one character in the copy paste. This code is applying some cloud scroll plus mask, doing DVI compositing and displaying that on the map. So now you can see, I have, if you have a long code, you can just paste it as a variable and do this. This kind of stuff is useful if you want to bulk convert scripts. A decent example where we ended up using this is that there's an Earth Engine Fundamentals and Application book. In that book, all the chapters are written using JavaScript. Now, we want to convert all the code into Python. Well, we just read that using Python, read the text, call this function, you get the Python equivalent. You can just save it. So if you want to bulk convert, can use this function. Otherwise, just you know, if you it's a one-off conversion, open a map, click this tool, paste your code, convert it.
and then you can run any JavaScript code into Python. The map here is also very flexible. It can display maps, it can display images and feature collections and all the objects that are then you can do. Let's do an exercise where we'll take some JavaScript code, convert it to Python and display a feature collection on a map in our lab notebook. Right now you can explain the exercise. So here we have this code and we are having this admin two regions of Karnataka and you have to convert it to Python. And if it works successfully, you will see your layer, Karnataka layer added to the map. So you can try any way. You can just do this using a map setting tool that we have, or you can use other function of GE map and convert it to Python and try to make it work. So make sure you first import the first cell. So run the first cell where you import in GE map, authenticate. Once you authenticate, you can create a map object. So scroll down. Yeah, here you have to create the map object. Once you have M, you can display this, click the converter, paste the code, convert it. And then in a new cell, when you run it, you'll see a map with the view. Make sure you type the M again at the end of the code block so that it displays the map. Or you can take the approach of automatic conversion where you can create a variable and paste the code here and then call the function to print the Python equivalent. Take that, put it in a new cell and run it. Either way is fine. Feel whichever way you feel comfortable, you can try that. Let's start with the next one. So one of the most common uses of Python API is in doing batch exports. Your JavaScript allows you to export images. But if you want to export a whole bunch of images, it becomes quite painful where you have to click run on each export. You'd write for loops. Again, it doesn't work very well in the browser side. But if the Python API allows you to not only start, create a task, but to start the task, stop the task, check the status of the task and so on. And also it just makes it much more seamless to work with large number of exports. So if you have a need to export 100, 200, 1000, 10,000 images from Earth Engine, use the batch export module where in Python API, which will allow you to do this. Let's learn <clears throat> how to do this. We have the notebook here, let's just make a copy. So let's copy to drive. This way you can modify and save your changes. Let's run the first few cell to initialize Earth Engine. And this is a step that has to be done every time you start a new session with Colab, you need to authenticate your account and the project that you want to use. Okay. We are authenticated. What we want to do is we want to do some processing in Earth Engine. Let's say we have a location and we want to get NDVI images from Sentinel-2 for one year. We want to use the really nice Cloud Score Plus mask, which is only in Earth Engine. So we want to use Earth Engine to apply this really nice mask, remove all the clouds. We also want to use Earth Engine for doing computation instead of me downloading images or the bands and doing this NDVI computation myself, I would like, want Earth Engine to do this. So we know how to do this. We'll you know, write a function to add NDVI band and map that over the collection. So we do all our pre-processing in Earth Engine. And at the end, I want to download the processed NDVI images for one year. So I have multiple images that will be collected over the location. I want to download each image. I don't want to download a composite or something. I just want to download each image. So I can maybe use another software or another technique that I use locally to analyze them further. Here we take our Sentinel-2 collection at the Cloud Score Plus mask. And again, you can take this function from the JavaScript, convert it to Python automatically and just use that. Or, you know, you can just convert it manually if you wanted to. But again, I simply took that function, put it on GMAP and converted it to Python version. And it just works as well. We have the NDVI function. And now we have this collection with a bunch of images with NDVI, which are also Cloud Mask. We want to know how many images are there and we just want to get the list of IDs. So there's this function, API function called aggregate array, which gives you a list of values for a particular property. Each image has this property called system colon index, which is the ID of the image. So we just say, I want to get the list of all the IDs and I want to know how many are there. I want to see that. And since we are in Python, I want to call get info on that. So let's run this. It says there are total 31 images in, over this point that were collected over one year, which are now cloud mask and they have the NDVI values. 
the IDs are also important. I can just see those IDs. Just if I type the variable name in a cell and run this, these are the image IDs. So this is one image, next image, and so on. And you can see the ID. This was on 13th January, 20th January, and so on. So there were all these individual images collected over this region. And I want to now export each of this. On the JavaScript side, I have to write a for loop, start a task, and I have to click run, 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 run on all of this. But I can let's do this using Python. The way to do this is we can, we have this 31 items in the list. We can write a for loop and say for each ID, find that image from the collection, build a supplier filter and saying, you know, we have this collection, find the image for that ID. So we just filter it. And now we have this image object, which we want to export. Then we write our export function. You'll notice that the function is very similar to what we write with JavaScript API. It's export image to drive image description, file name, the name of the file will be the ID of the image. We'll export it to this earth engine folder. For now, we are exporting it hundred meter resolution, just so that, you know, I can show you the result and don't have to wait for the images to be exported because 31 images at 10 meter resolution may take, you know, maybe 30 minutes to export fully. So again, for demonstration, we're using a lower resolution, but you should export it at 10 meter if you were to do this. The region, we say each image has a bounding box. We want to export that region. So we'll use the image geometry. Since we are in Python, we'll prefix our dictionary of parameters with double star. But you'll notice one big change. Instead of just using export image to drive, we are now using ee.batch.export image to drive. This is a function that's available only in the Python API. There's an ee.batch module, which has all the functions for doing batch exports. When you run this, this creates a task object. So it says, I've created a task. It's still waiting for you. So this is equivalent to in the code editor, it says, oh, there's something waiting for you to click run. You have to go and click run manually. But with this e.batch API, we can say, I have a task object. I can say start task.start. And it'll just start the task without me doing anything. So now I have this 31 export task. I can just say run. And I can just sit back and watch my task get created, one for each image. And they'll just get started automatically. I don't have to click anything. If this were a collection with 10,000 images, it'll just take maybe 10 minutes to start all the tasks and they'll be all queued up in your account. At, at a single time, there'll be about, I think at most three tasks they'll be running. As soon as one task finishes, Earth Engine will automatically start the next one in the queue and so on. This task, I'll load it to your account, whichever account is linked to the project which you had specified. Let me open up Code Editor and I'll show you what our tasks look like. If I switch to my task tab, you can see my tasks are here. How come they are here? They are here because the task gets started into your account. You are using the API from either code editor or your Colab notebook, it's the same account. So when you start the task from one place, they'll also show up in another place. And you can see these tasks are now running and they have been started. So you can see these are all in the queue for my task. The task API also says, okay, maybe I made a mistake. I don't want to do this. I want to just cancel them. So you can say e.batch task.list. You can check the status of each of them. This is helpful where you say I have a long running task. Once the task A finishes, I want to start task B. So you can write code saying while the task A status is running, wait. And once it finishes, start the task B. So you can kind of monitor and launch task in sequence. So we have all this task. We want to say, I, I've changed my mind. I want to cancel everything. So I can run this and all the pending tasks that are either running or ready, they'll all get canceled. And you can also see them through your code editor. All the tasks will now get canceled, which were all in the pending status. So you have a lot more control over your tasks where you can create one, get a list of them, check the status, and also cancel them. And all of those changes will reflect in your account and you know, in, since they are linked to the same project. I wanna show you what those images would look like. So once the export finishes, this is what the image would look like. This is a single band of NDVI that we exported. You can see it's cloud masked and you have the actual pixels values, NDVI values. And you can see for this region, the NDVI is between zero and 0.26. This data is now a geotiff that resides on your computer and you can use them in your analysis. You can see these are not composites. Each one is an individual image. 
So we can see this is the next image. We can see most of the data is masked and so on. So again, if you wanted whole images, you can export them this way and you get one image for each export. Okay, let's do an exercise to practice exports. Ina, you can explain the exercise. So for the exercise here, we have this Australia geometry. We have Terra climate data. We are filtering it for these dates and we have this image collection. We want to export this image collection. So here you just have to create a task and start the task to export it to the drive. Here you see that we want to export the clipped image. So these images are already in the loop and you want to just export the clipped image and uh, you have to use the same similar task here. So this is the same thing that you are going to do, but you have to just take care of scale and other parts. So just change the scale, change the input image and other parameters if you feel like changing like giving spe specific name to the image or something like that you can change it and you can have the same task here so scale as i think mentioned yeah so scale and geometry also has to be changed so we are using a specific geometry here so the whole images are global images so if you say image.geometry the global scale but in this yeah. case we want to export it only over australia so we just use the geometry as the geometry value yeah, so we already have the geometry variable, so you can directly use this geometry variable. So start the task, have the task, start the task, after changing the geometry, scale, and the input image. The idea here is we want to export one image per month for a year. So we have the maximum monthly temperature image. We just want to clip it to Australia and just get those 12 images for each month of the year. For folks who are new to Python, I want to give you a little bit more hints uh, on how to do this as we learned previously that python is very sensitive to white space and when you are copy pasting code you need to be really aware of the white space so let's just see we have this 12 images in the collection i want to export them we have the the code snippet available here so i want to copy this code and paste it here so you can paste it here but you can see this kind of pasted in the wrong indentation. I want to make sure that my indentation level matches of the code above. So I want to make sure I can take this and press tab on this. At the next one, I can also tab this. This one also has to be the same level and so on. If you put this outside, it will be considered outside the loop. If you have a different indentation like this, you'll get an error. So when you copy pasting code, make sure you take care of the indentation and all your whole code has to be indented within this particular block that we have. And then we have to change the image. So I'm going to change the image here. We'll change it to be clipped image. The image ID remains the same. Scale, we have to change it to the Terra climate scale. So I think this is going to be 4632 or 4638.3. That's the one to export to the geometry, which is Australia. And then we want to start the task. And when you run this successfully, you should see those 12 tasks start and once they are run, you will get this Australia images in your Google Drive. Once your export finishes, you should get an image like this. This is the, the temperature, monthly te max temperature over Australia. And you have this individual images for each month. And you can see as the new images are being exported, I'm getting them downloaded. A pro tip is if you want the images to be automatically downloaded to your computer, you install the Google Drive application. I have that Google Drive application installed. So as soon as a new file appears in my Earth Engine folder, it gets synced to my computer. So I don't have to go and download it manually. Super helpful if you're doing a lot of exports. Let's do the next notebook. So far, we have learned how to use the Python Earth Engine API and do the processing using the Earth Engine API that is provided through a Python environment. There are use cases where you say Earth Engine is great at pre-processing at large scale distributed computation. But there are certain features that are only available in, let's say, a Python package that I want to use. And I want to take the data from Earth Engine and use it alongside other Python packages. You also notice that the Python API doesn't have a charting function. I want to use the charting functions from Python. Python has so many charting libraries, very powerful and mature APIs to create charts. So I want to take this data from Earth Engine and create some chart, which is either not possible in Earth Engine, or I just want to use the library that I'm comfortable with. You will learn how to integrate Earth Engine with the rest of the Python ecosystem. Notably, we have a new package called XEE, which is about a year old now. It's getting quite mature recently and it's quite usable. It was released as like a 
beta product, but now it's a pretty mature product that you can start using. What this package does is that it uses the ee data dot get pixels. This is a new function that's available in the Python API to say, I don't want to just do computation in Earth Engine and get the result. I want to get the actual pixels from Earth Engine as a Python object. And then you can do something with this in Python. So the main library that is used in Python for doing image processing is this package called X-Ray. And this package allows you to download Earth Engine data as X-Ray objects. And then you can use all of the X-Ray functions to do your processing, including plotting, time series smoothing, spatial statistics, and so on. So it has a very wide array of packages in the X-Ray ecosystem, and you can use all of that with your Earth Engine data. This is quite exciting where now Earth Engine is great, but it doesn't do everything. Python is great. It doesn't do everything. Now you can combine the power of both using this. So let's learn how to integrate Earth Engine with the rest of the Python ecosystem. We'll work on this notebook for time series processing. The idea here is X-Array. One of the strengths of the X-Array package is that it understands time and it's called built-in functions for doing time series processing. When you work with any time series data in remote sensing, you have to do things like, I want to fill gaps. I want to do interpolation. I want to do smoothing. I want to fit some function and smooth it. And since our remote sensing time series is are not just a single dimension time series, we have images. I want to apply those gap filling and smoothing across all images. Earth Engine doesn't have any built-in function to do it. I wrote some code a couple of years back, a few hundred lines of code that does it. But again, you have to implement each function yourself. And I could only implement a few with the time I had. But now, if you want to do something, x can do all of that. So let's use Earth Engine for doing all the pre-processing, getting a nice time series, and then use x for doing the time series processing. At this time, the XEE package doesn't come pre-installed with the Colab. So first step is we have to install it. To install packages in Python, we have to use this command pip, pip install XEE. So that will install the XEE package in your Colab environment. Again, this will install on the machine that you are running the code currently. So next time you come tomorrow, you have to do the installation again. So every time you run the notebook in a new session, you have to install this. We have this exclamation mark in a notebook environment. This means let's run this command on the computer. It's not a Python command. It just runs on the computer in the terminal. So that's what this command is. So now once we have this C installed, we can start doing our work. We'll import E along with E, we'll import X-Ray because we want to use X-Ray to download our data. And then we'll use matplotlib, which is the a library to create charts using Python. And we'll use that. We'll do our initialization. When you use X-Ray, the way X-Ray works, it's kind of internally very similar to how Earth Engine is set up, where you have some images and you want to compute some product from that image. Earth Engine says, I'll split this into different tiles and each tile is computed by a different machine. X-Ray also has this concept of chunks where you have an X-Ray object is divided into small, small chunks and each chunk can be processed independently by a different machine or a different core on your computer or just by in different sequence. And that means when you use X-Ray and do some processing, you will start firing so many requests to the Earth Engine backend. Say, this chunk is asking for data for this. This chunk is asking data for this and so on. And that's why if you use XE, you can give this optional parameter to say, I want to use this another backend of Earth Engine called Earth Engine High Volume Backend. The default backend that we use is suitable for think, saying that, okay, I want to do this. I'm describing what I want to do. And I make a call. The backend does what it wants and returns a result. If I'm just sending hundreds of requests to the backend saying, give me pixels, give me pixels give me pixels. The main backend is not designed for that. If you're just asking for a bunch of pixels through different calls, you have to use the high volume backend. So we just say we are using X-Ray. Let's use the high volume endpoint. And we have linked to the documentation you can learn what this is. And if you're a commercial user, there are some additional costs associated with this. So you can learn more about those here. So the idea is we want to select a location and extract an NDVI time series for a year. So we want to take our image collection, do cloud masking, compute NDVI. And then for each point, we want to know what is the NDVI for that particular year. And we just want to extract those values. So we'll use Earth Engine to do the pre-processing and then we'll take that results and post-process that using X-Ray. Select location in the order of the coordinates is 
X and Y. So it's longitude and latitude. So this is some location that we want to extract the time series of. We take our Sentinel-2 collection, apply our filters, do cloud masking, add NDVI band and do this. Now this stuff is where Earth Engine really shines, right? You can do this very, very efficiently. If you have to do this in other systems, it's a very painful process. So we did the kind of Earth Engine did the heavy lifting and now we have our time series. So let's say I have this image, sequence of images. I, I want to use X-ray to do the post-processing. So now we say we have this image collection. I want to download that and extract that as an array in Python. So now we are in X-ray ecosystem. If you don't know X-ray, don't worry. You can, once you learn it, it'll make sense. Right now, what you need to understand is how to integrate this X-ray with Earth Engine. We say, I want to open this data set called with NDVI using this engine called E. So it's an Earth Engine data set. I'll give CRS and the scale. So the meters, and then this is a geometry. So let's run this. And you see, we have now an X-ray object. So we have an X-ray object, which says there are 31 time dimensions. We have 31 time step. And since this was just a single point, we have one X coordinate and one Y coordinate. And now we have extracted this as a X-ray data set. It's still, this one is not on your computer. It's still in the cloud. We just said, this is what the final array will look like. We have not computed the values. You don't know what the values are. This one has all the bands. So you can see we have not done any band selection. So we just have all the bands from Earth Engine. We just say we want the NDVI band. So we select the NDVI band. And finally we say, I'm ready. I just want this data on my computer, like in, in Python as an array. You can call dot compute dot compute will now fetch all this required data from earth engine as pixels and load them in the ram for python so this is the call that will now fire off all the requests to earth engine and say let me get all the data as python so i'll run this since we have a pretty small data set it just works but if you had a polygon for example instead of this this might take like a minute or two to get all the data and now you can see i have my time series i have an array object and I have these values. At this point, this exists in Python. We are out of Earth Engine now. So once we did this, we don't no longer need Earth Engine. All the other processing happens locally now. Now you have an array, you can do anything you can do with array in Python. You don't need any Earth Engine API functions. So this is how we get data from Earth Engine. We get an image collection, open it with X-ray, and then say dot compute, which will fetch all the pixels that we need from Earth Engine into our Python memory. Let's plot this time series. To create this chart, we can use matplotlib. You can see this is what the time series looks like. We have one year worth of data. You can see we have some values. Intermediate values were cloud masked. So we have this missing values, which are all cloudy. And then we have some noise. You can see there's some noise here. And, but this is what the plot looks like. And if you want to use this any system, you say, I want to build a model to predict NDVI. To do this, you first need to do gap filling. Say, so what's here? I need to have a gap filling. I need to also smooth time series. So I remove the noise and I need to fit a function and say, this is what this time series looks like. So we'll do all of that using X-ray. X-ray just provides you with those functions built in. You don't have to implement them like you have to do it in Earth Engine. So we can do a few things. We can say, I have, I expect a value to be there every five days with the Sentinel-2. I have a lot of missing values. You can see there's one value, this next value is missing and so on. Let me regularize this time series. So that's the first step in doing your analysis. We just want a value at every n number of days. X-ray has this function called resample. We just say resample this at five day time interval. This is not spatial resample. This is a temporal resample. So we just now have regularly spaced time series. We have the first value, next is missing, third value, next is missing, and so on. Once we have that, we can say, do interpolation. So we have this two value values, interpolate this value based on these two values. We can specify what kind of interpolation we want. We just do a linear interpolation. And now you can see we have these values that filled. So now we have a regular time series and say, if this was 0.5 on day one, 0.63 on day 10, on day five, it should be 0.57. So we have kind of interpolated and filled those values. We can also do some smoothing. 
to remove the outliers and noise. So there are many methods of smoothing that X-Array provides. We just do a rolling window smoothing, so moving window smoothing. And now we have a smooth time series. Let's see the results. And you can see we had the original time series in the dash line before, and now we have this really nice smooth time series that we had computed using X-Array. X-Array is really efficient at doing this kind of temporal operations for a lot of functions to work with this. So especially remote sensing time series, you want to apply this. This we did only for one pixel for simplicity, but if you had a polygon, this would do this at every pixel. So we'll say dot smooth, it'll just smooth every pixel and you get this gap fill regular time series at every pixel. Super valuable, one of the very important pre-processing step that you have to do for any kind of modeling purposes. And now we have this data, let's just download it. We can just download it as a CSV file. Since we are in the Python ecosystem, we can use rest of the Python libraries to do the processing. We'll just use the pandas library for downloading this as a CSV. So we'll convert to a data frame and finally we save it to a CSV. When we download something, this gets downloaded to the machine where this collab notebook is running. If you want to access the disk of that, you can click here. This is a file system button here. If we click here, it shows the file system of that machine that we had. And you can see we now have a new CSV file, which is what we created just now. And now finally I can say download it to my computer and it'll just go and download this. So now we have a CSV file that we first created in Earth Engine as an image collection, converted it to an X-ray object, smoothed it, interpolated it, and now convert it to a data frame and extracted this. And we can have a nice CSV like this. The Python folks will find all of this workflow very intuitive. Once you have your array in Python, so once you have your array in Python, you can use all of the Python tools that you are familiar with. Okay. Let's try an exercise where you can test this workflow and get an NDVA time series for your own location. Right now you can explain the exercise. So for the exercise, we want to do this for any other location of your choice and extract the smooth time series. So here you see that you have to run all the cells anyway. And here is your geometry. So you will have to change this location and run rest of the cells so that you will generate the NDVI time series. You will do the gap filling, smoothen it and eventually you will have the script to export it as CSV. So do all the steps after changing that geometry point that you have in cell number four. But yeah, you will have to run all the cells and change this one. We have done this so far in the module. We are done with the, the hands-on exercise part. We have some extra demos that will show you what all you can do with Python and Earth Engine. A lot of this stuff is more advanced, but I just want to give you a glimpse of what is possible. So when you have encounter with a similar challenge, you know that it's possible. You can come back to our course material and try this yourself. So we now going to do a bunch of demos on Python and Earth Engine. This will show you what is possible. Some of this will make sense to people who are using Python in a production environment. So, you know, you're running some jobs in cloud environment and you want to use Earth Engine, how to do this. Some of this will make sense for people who are using Earth Engine and QGIS, how to create maps in QGIS using Earth Engine. So again, we have different use cases of Python and Earth Engine. We're going to go through that. The first one is automating download and export. Second, we'll see how to do this in QGIS. And then finally, we'll see how to do deep learning with Earth Engine. All of these topics are, again, quite deep. It'll take a long time to cover this in depth, but we're going to just do a demo. We'll do Q&A and you can, we have all of the steps documented on the course material. So you can try this if you wish to do this yourself. So let's see how we can automate some processes using the Python API in Earth Engine. Let's say we want to automate some download process. Every Monday morning, I want to run some job and process data for the past week. Or I want to run my exports in the cloud. Let's say I have a job that says every hour check for something new. If something new image comes in, export it to our cloud account. How do we kind of schedule those jobs? How do we set it up? How do we use Earth Engine in an automated fashion? So far, we have learned how to use the Python API from a Colab notebook. Colab is a great environment for data science where you can interactively run itself, see the result, tweak your code and see the results. Once you have your notebook and you know what you want to do, you want to do this fast, you want to do this in an automated fashion, you can take this code, put it in a standalone Python script 
and use Earth Engine from there. And that means you don't have to click each cell and run this. You can just say, I have a script that just runs and uses Earth Engine as just another Python package to do some data processing. To do this, we have to install Python along with the Earth Engine API package on the machine that we want to do it. If you're running this on your own machine, you install it locally. If you're doing this on a server, you have to install the Python package on the server. We have detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to install and configure. This is quite a complex process, but we have tested it thoroughly. It also keeps changing as Google updates the cloud system. So we try to keep it up to date, but you can follow the instructions here to get your environment set up with the Earth Engine package installed and authenticated and configured. When you are running any stuff locally, remember in Colab, we have to authenticate every time. You don't have to do this every time if you just install Python on your system. You install Python, you install Earth Engine API, and then you just run this command, Earth Engine Authenticate. So one time step, you open a terminal, Earth Engine space, Authenticate. Run it, it'll ask you to sign in, go through the workflow, and then whatever code it generates will be saved on a machine. And you never have to do this again. So you can just do Earth Engine Authenticate once, and then on your machine, you'll never have to sign in again. You can just say import e, e dot initialize, and you can keep doing your work. We'll do the demo shortly on how that works. The next one I want to show you is how to run some stuff on the cloud. When you do Earth Engine Authenticate, you are signed in to your Google account. And that makes sense if you are just using on your own machine. But if you're running something on the cloud, you don't want to be signed into your own account in cloud. That's a security risk. And again, I don't want to give access to my account to everybody who has access to the machine. The way to do this is using something called a service account. People who use clouds, you'll know what a service account is. A service account is like a virtual account that has certain permissions. You say, I have this new account that can access my Earth Engine API, but that's it. And I can use that account with Earth Engine. So we'll show you how to configure your Python script to use a service account and then do a bunch of export, not through a notebook, but just through a script. Run the script, you'll start a bunch of export. So let's dive into the code and see both of these demos. First, we'll show you how to download data. This comes from a project that I worked on where the client wanted to have a system where they say we are building a dashboard. We want to update our dashboard every week. And we want to extract some data from Earth Engine to build our dashboard and update the dashboard. And they had a system ready and they said, we want to get a CSV file with the data from Earth Engine extract it every week and you should run it and just extract that data automatically and our script will just use that and it'll be displayed in the dashboard how do you set up something like this you can create a file on your system so this is just a regular python file where we import e we do our initialization so again when you authenticate it once on a machine you never have to authenticate again so this will run without any prompt in between we will just say e initialize and now you can do some work. We can say, I want data for past week. So current time minus one week. So we have the two dates. We'll take some data here. We're using some soil moisture data for some admin regions. We take this, we apply some filters. We run some zonal stats using reduced regions. For each polygon, we want the average soil moisture. We compute that. And finally, we just get all of that as a CSV. So we get the results of that zonal stats and save it as a CSV file on the machine. So this script, we can put all the code in the script and run this. Let's see how that works. This is a terminal on my machine. I've installed Earth Engine API along with Python on my machine. We recommend using Conda. So if you read our instruction, we'll say you have to create a new environment called Conda E. That's a new environment. So we once you've configured it, we can say, I'm going to use the stuff that is installed in the E environment. So now we are in this E environment where it can recognize the Earth Engine command. So if I type Earth Engine, it should just say, yeah, I know what Earth Engine is. I can use Earth Engine Authenticate. So once I run this, it's authenticated forever. So I don't have to do this again. And now I can run some scripts. I have my script here. So this is the script that I've written, which is on my computer. It's just a py.py script where we just go take the current date, get the date one week before, and then download some data locally. This script exists on my desktop here. I'm going to show you. So you can see this is a script. There's no other file here. So I'm now going to run this file and say, I want to run this. So I can say Python, download data. And right now the script is running and saying, e, import E, initialize it, get the feature collection, do the zonal stats, 
download this as a CSV. You can see without me doing anything, running anything, just script ran and I get a CSV file, which is the soil moisture for every admin two region in the state for the past one week. And let's get a CSV file and we have the result. Now you can automate this by saying, run this command Python download data Monday morning automatically. There are many ways to do this. If you're on Windows server, you can use Windows scheduler. If you're on Linux server, you can use cron tab and schedule this and say every Monday morning, 6 a.m. run this command and every Monday morning you'll have a new CSV file. And this is how you use Earth Engine automatically using Python. For the next demo, I want to show you how to automate exports. So how to run Earth Engine Python code on the server using a service account and also launch a bunch of exports automatically. When you have a Google Cloud account, you can create a service account in your Google Cloud console and give the appropriate permission to the service account to say the service account can access this services. It has access to this much data and this many users are able to use the service account and so on. Once we create a service account, and again, if you click on this link, you will get the instructions on how to do this. You will get an email address that looks like this. So based on how you configure, you will get an email address your account name at project.iam.gserviceaccount.com. So this is the email ID that identifies your service account. Once you create a service account, you'll also get a JSON file, which contains a, a secret key, which is like a password. So you'll get an email account and a password that you can use to run Earth Engine code. So this email account is now has access to your Google Cloud services, Earth Engine, and so on. So instead of using your own credentials on a server, you say, I'll use a service account and I'll use this JSON file, which contains my key. Let's go and see the demo. The idea here is we are taking the TerraClimate data and starting the bunch of exports from our computer without going through the notebook and running all of this. So the same uh, Australia TerraClimate export that we had done in the previous section, we're gonna do this automatically using code here. So here is my file. So I have my uh, Earth Engine account. I have my service account email. And now I will initialize the account, not with a project, not with my own credentials. I say, I want to utilize this service account email and a key file that exists in my computer. You can give the path to where the key file is. On a server, you need to store it in a place which is not publicly accessible. Right now I'm doing this demo on my computer. So I have this file stored on my system here. So it's on the same folder. But on a server, you'll put it somewhere which is more secure and give the path here. And once we initialize, we run our script and do the export. So let's run this. I can just say Python export data. And now the script will run and it'll just start the bunch of export tasks into my Earth Engine account. So this is how you can set up and authenticate Earth Engine on a server and then automate your exports. And you can see this, if I go to my code editor, those tasks will be running. Once the task finishes, I'll get my results either in Google Drive if I've chosen that or a cloud storage account. Okay, the last demo, which is also my favorite demo, how to use Earth Engine in QGIS. And we have this really nice plugin called Google Earth Engine plugin for QGIS. This allows you to run Earth Engine Python code within QGIS. QGIS is an open source GIS, which has rich cartography. It understands different projections. You can create maps and it allows you to create these rich cartographic outputs. Earth Engine is great for doing data processing, not so much for creating pretty maps. QGIS, you know, it's not great, not well suited for doing large scale raster data processing. So we can utilize both and say, let's use Earth Engine for doing the data processing. Once we have a result, we can just view the data in QGIS. We don't want to export. We just want to view the data directly in QGIS and create maps in QGIS. Let's see how that works. I'm going to open QGIS. So here I am in QGIS. First, I will go and install the plugin. The plugin is called Google Earth Engine. Once you find it in the Plugin manager can install it. Once you install it, the first time you install and enable this, you will be prompted to sign into your account. So you'll just go through the same authentication workflow 
select account, continue, continue, approve, and then the authentication token will be saved on the machine. Once it's done, now your QGIS can call Earth Engine. Once it's installed, you can now say import EE into your QGIS Python console. So now QGIS understands what EE is. And remember, we can do all the EE functions, but when you want to display some results, instead of doing map.add layer and seeing that in code editor, when you say map.add layer in QGIS, the map will appear in QGIS canvas directly. So the data will be streamed from Earth Engine directly to your QGIS. Let's do a demo. I'm going to take the code from here and paste it into QGIS. So this is the Python console. We open the editor from the Python console. Here we say import E. We have the E plugin. We'll import the map. So now all the map dot calls, add layer calls, will now appear in QGIS. We take the CMIP6 collection, which is the climate projections data. We select a model and a scenario and say, I want to know what would the world look like in 2030 under the scenario? What will the temperature uh, look like in the globe? So we do this, we do the processing. Finally, when we have the data, we just say map to that layer. This is the same Python API call. But now since I'm running in QGIS, you'll see that but the code will get sent to Earth Engine. Earth Engine send me the results directly. Now I have this map in QGIS. It's not exported, it's just real time display. So if I zoom in to some region, you'll see that QGIS is fetching the data from Earth Engine. And now I have this visualization. If I change some code here and turn it, my layer will update. So this is a great way to say, I'll do my analysis, but I want to see my results in QGIS. What's the advantage of Doing this, well, one, you can now overlay another local data layers and interact with it and do something with it. You can also create some really interesting visualizations. For example, this kind of global data is best suited on a globe, not on a flat map. So we can use QGIS to say, change the projection of this map to a globe and we'll, we'll see the data on the globe. I wanna show you another plugin that helps us create this global projections a plugin called Globe Builder. This is a plugin that allows you to just set your map to a, a global projection. You open the plugin and we say which projection you want. We want some azimuthal orthographic projection. This will turn your map into a globe. You can say where you want to center the map. You can say center on the current view. And then once we're happy with it, we can just say add globe to a map. And now what happened is you just turn the map into a globe. Earth Engine is saying, oh, I need the data for this projection and this viewport. It's going to send the new data. And you can see my map is now in the globe. So now I have Earth Engine data being streamed from Earth Engine directly into QGIS as a globe. And this is something you cannot do this in Earth Engine. Now I can take this, create a map, and do this very easily. Let me just change this, maybe a background color to be white, and it'll be a much nicer view. We will learn how to do deep learning with Earth Engine. The Google preferred way to do deep learning is through a system called Vertex AI. This is Google's cloud platform for doing AI model training and prediction at scale. You can think of Vertex AI is like Earth Engine for machine learning. So Earth Engine has some machine learning models, but for deep learning and other modern AI approaches, Vertex AI provides you with a way to host your models, train your models, and run them across many machines. This is Google's flagship product for deep learning, and it's not free. So this is probably suitable for people who want to utilize machine learning commercially using Google's cloud platform. So you can use Vertex AI and create models using any of the supported platform. They have something called AutoML as well, which is like the no code solution. You can describe what kind of model you want, what data you have, and just create some models and fine tunes it automatically. Earth Engine API will work with models that are hosted on Vertex AI. So you use Vertex AI and either TensorFlow or PyTorch or AutoML to create your machine learning model, deep learning model, CNNs, any kind of model that you want to build, host it there. And now you can say, I will use that model in Earth Engine. 
there is a Earth Engine API function called e model from Vertex AI, which will load a model from Vertex AI in Earth Engine. And you can now say, I have an image. I want to predict on that. So you'll take an image and say image dot predict image and you just run that model on the image. And this will work at Earth Engine scale. So if you have a model that can detect cars, for example, from image, and you have an image for uh, an entire country, you run it, you'll get cars for entire country. It'll run in parallel. It will get this kind of real-time interactive experience that Earth Engine provides with the model that is hosted in Vertex AI. The user guide contains a whole examples on how to use this. Let's see some of them. If you go to the user guide, there is a whole section on machine learning and there is a Vertex AI example workflow. And again, you, there's a big warning here that this stuff is not free, even for free users of Earth Engine. Because this is not Earth Engine, this is Vertex AI. You can, you know, it shows how to do crop classification, how to do a CNN, do some land cover classification, a deep neural network segmentation, and, you know, some other using a pre-trained model and so on. So quite a bit of code and example notebooks available. All of them are using Vertex AI. And this is what Google says is a preferred integration for Earth Engine and uh, AI. So if you want to use this, you can use this. Be careful. This is meant for large scale jobs, which require a lot of data for training, a lot of data for prediction. And what they say is not free. It's not only not free, it's also very expensive. So make sure you, the people who want to use this are people who are using machine learning, at, doing deep learning at scale. And they have a product that they're generating and you want to run this on ImageD for large regions. And if you're willing to pay for it, this is a good integration for doing deep learning. What I want to teach you instead is another method of doing deep learning, which I'm calling it offline deep learning, where you can still do deep learning stuff. You can build models, run it on Earth Engine data, see the results in Earth Engine, but not at the scale that Vertex AI provides and not in real time. You have to train the model, predict it. It takes time. Once you do this, you can load the results in Earth Engine seed. This is a great way to get started with deep learning in Earth Engine. If you're a student, if you're a researcher, this method will work for you. It's also a completely free method. So you don't pay any money. You just use Colab and Earth Engine to do this. This will not scale to very large regions, but it is a good for building models that work on small regions, doing some demonstrations or doing proof of concept. And if you do this, if you like this and you say this is useful, you can take your model, host it on Vertex AI, and then use it at scale once you are willing to pay for it. So I'll demonstrate a workflow that uses this approach, and it might be suitable for people who want to start doing deep learning with Earth Engine. The workflow we'll use is we'll first get our image in Earth Engine. So you can use Earth Engine to create a composite, apply some cloud mask to composite, add different bands and so on. And we'll collect some training samples. So if you have points, polygons, you extract the reflectance values from those. And once you have it, that becomes your training data. You export it to Google Cloud Storage. Once you have data in cloud storage, you build a model using TensorFlow and Keras. Train the model using the data you exported from Earth Engine. Then you take the entire image that you had predicted. So yeah, this you'll export the image as well. You export the image and run the prediction on that image and saying, I've trained a model. Now predict for each pixel or each batch. Once you have the predictions, you export it to cloud storage and you import it into Earth Engine and you see the result in Earth Engine. If you use the Vertex AI, you can say, I have my model on Vertex AI. You can just directly call this and see the result immediately in Earth Engine. The offline flow that I'm teaching, which is the free alternative to Vertex AI, we'll have to export everything, build the model, train it, and then see the result. Here, all of this happens in Earth Engine. So your image pre-processing and post-processing happens in Earth Engine. Your data is in the cloud storage system, and the training happens in the Colab network. So we're using three different services to do this. Out of this, Colab is free. Earth Engine can be free if you are uh, using the free account. Cloud storage has a free tier. You will still do sign up and use the data, but you can store a small amount of data, a few gigabytes free of cost. Yeah, so again, you can use the solution free of cost without paying any money and still try out how the deep learning works in the Google Earth Engine ecosystem. 
we have some scripts and demos here. So let us go and hit that. Again, I have a warning here. Cloud storage is free up only up to a certain limit. The free tier may vary. So go and check once you sign up, see how much data you can store for free and how much will be charged apart from that. So make sure you understand that you may get charged if you store a lot of data in cloud storage. First, let's see script to export data. So I'm going to open up the script. This could be a Python script or a JavaScript code editor. doesn't matter. You're just exporting some image into a format that you can use with TensorFlow. So that's what I want to show you. We'll take the example of the classification that we did in module four, sorry, module three of our course, where we take, took this composite of a basin and classified this into four classes. We have the same image here. So we have our image and I want to do some deep learning on this. How do I export it? Do I export it as GeoTIFF? Well, GeoTIFF can be exported, but if you're using TensorFlow, Earth Engine ha allows you to export the data in a format called TF record. So you can export vector and raster data in this format called TF record, which is a format that is suitable for doing deep learning. And this is what you do if you say, I want to take this image and use deep learning. You will export this as TF record. You can also export it to cloud storage, which is what your collab can read directly and write directly. So if you want to import stuff into Earth Engine, Earth Engine only allows you to import data from cloud storage, not from a drive. So that's why we will export stuff to your cloud storage. So once we export this, we export our training data, testing data, and our images, both as our TF records. Let me show you what that looks like. This is the, the Google Cloud Console showing the Google Cloud Storage. You have you have to create something called a bucket. Bucket is where you store data in your cloud storage. I have this bucket here called Earth Engine TF. Once I export my data here, you'll see that I get each image as a small file. So this is a TF record file of one part of the image. And this is 6.4 MB. This is like a small patch that is there. And you get a bunch of TF records. And my entire composite was exported as this whole bunch of TF records, which contain our image data. I'll also export the training and testing data. You can see this is a training TF record and testing TF record. So all of those are also exported as TF record files. So once the export is there, now we can dive into Colab and say, well, I want to train some model. Here's where the power of the Colab GPU backend come in. When you're doing any kind of deep learning, you should connect to a GPU backend, which will make your training and testing much, much faster. So make sure you change your backend to a GPU. We are building a deep neural network to do this kind of classification. So instead of doing a random forest model, we are building a deep learning model, a neural network to take the input 12 bands and predict a class. The advantage of a neural network is it can learn much more nonlinear patterns. And if your data is, has some nonlinear patterns, our deep learning model can model it much more accurately than other models. It may not be the bad, good thing to do. If your data has linear patterns and you try to fit a, a neural network, it might give you really bad results. So again, deep learning is not a solution to all the problems, but if your the, the relationship between input and output are nonlinear, neural network is a better suited for this. So this will go through the workflow in case you want to try this notebook yourself, you have to replace all of this with your thing. So you, you need to change your cloud project. You need to change the bucket team that you're using for export and so on. The first part is just reading the TF record data that is stored in your cloud storage into TensorFlow. So we get training data and we have our input records here. We have to create a model. So we are creating a model that is a very simple neural network. We have 12 inputs and four outputs. We have one hidden layer of neurons. The way neural network works, it's first, it's initialized with random weights. And say, I have some reflectance values. I want to predict zero. So how do I take these values and transform them into one zero zero zero? That's the task of the network. These are the weights of the links, they have to be adjusted so that when you take this value multiplied by the weight, 
add it all up, multiply by this weight, add it all up, it should become one, rest should become zero. So when you want to train the data first, it's all random. It says, I have some input values. What's the prediction? It say, oh, this predicted to be 0 0.5, 0 0.500. It'll go back and adjust those weights back and say, okay, let's try again. And it'll try the next data. And it'll keep training till it figures out the weights of all those links. And that's the training phase. You need to figure out the weight of each of these links so that when you're given some values, you can predict the right class. We build the model with Keras. This is a very simple model. Deep learning models can be much more complex, but I'll tell you why even this is you know, very complex for the kind of data that we have. So when you look at this model and you say, show me how many parameters it has, how many weights it has, this model itself has more than 2000 parameters. So there are more than 2000 weights that need to be figured out. We only have 500 training samples. And that means I have 500 data points and to figure out 2000 parameters. And that means you can see this data is not sufficient. So even a simple model like this is so data hungry that to figure out a model with 2000 parameters, you will need at least 100,000 training samples. If I add one more layer, my number of parameters will increase exponentially. And that's why you always hear, I train this deep learning model with this many millions of data points, because as you have models which are more complex, you'll need a lot more data points. Once you have a model, you can now classify the image, you read your image. And finally, once you read the image, this is where you do the prediction. You can say model.predict and you have an image. So once the model is trained, it predicts. This is a step which will take a long time. Since we are running this on a notebook, we are running this in sequential. We just have one machine, one GPU doing the work for us. We don't have Earth Engine and millions or thousands of machines doing work for us. We have our image patches. They are being read one by one. They send it to GPU, it'll predict, and it'll save it. For the example, for this particular thing, it takes about 30 minutes for this model to predict all the pixels in the image. So again, you will not get the performance you get with Vertex AI, where you can do real-time prediction. But for small enough regions, it is good enough for you to try out and see how it works. Once your prediction is there, we'll save it. We'll save the results to cloud storage. And finally, once the results are there, we can say I have my results as TF records on my output. So you can see the this is the output. We have some TF record, which is a classified image. It is sitting here. We can say directly import this into Earth Engine as an Earth Engine image. So the last bit says Earth Engine upload image at asset ID and my file. So this can Earth Engine upload can take an image in the TF record format and convert it to an Earth Engine image. So once we upload this, we go into Earth Engine and let's see the result. We have, once we've done this, we'll have an asset in Earth Engine, which is the result of the TensorFlow model. Let's just kind of get an idea of how good this model is. It's not really great model, but still with the less amount of data, it does a pretty good job. So here on the map, we are loading our random forest model, which we had created in module three with all the NDVI and other parameters. And this is what the classification looked like. Here we have the mod, the image that was classified by the neural network that we had trained. And if you see the image, you'll see that there are some differences, but again, it did a fairly decent job. The random forest made mistakes somewhere else. This one made mistakes elsewhere. It's not perfect, but again, this is a very simple DNN model. You can actually make it much better, but you need a lot more training data. In this case, I would say you would need at least 50,000 training samples, and then you can build a model much, which is much more efficient. But you can kind of see the power of deep learning where if you had enough training data, a model like this can do this kind of classification job, model this nonlinear relationship much better. This is the workflow where you can now use cloud storage and collab to store data and do some model building and then see the results in Earth Engine. I want to show another model that might come in handy for you if you want to do object detection. There is this amazing library called Segment Geospatial. This is based on a deep learning model called Segment Anything that was released by Facebook. This is a pre-trained model. That means you don't need to train it. It's trained on lots and lots of images. I don't know how many, I think few billion images or something. Facebook trained it on that. 
this is a geospatial version of this. It works remarkably well on geospatial images, and you can use this to identify objects from an image without doing any training. So if you say, I have an image, I want to extract buildings, roads, trees, you want to do segmentation tasks, you have a pre-trained model that you can use through this package, and it's very, very easy to use. Let me show some demos. All the demos are linked from this URL. I'm going to show this to one, extracting farm boundaries and extracting mine perimeters. So, so the two projects I worked on using this, where initial idea was to build a deep learning model, but then we just said, we have a pre-trained model. It works remarkably well, and you don't need training data. You just run the model on the data. So let's see how that works. One note, when you're running this models, make sure you choose the GPU backend. If you try on a GPU backend, this demo takes a minute to predict. On a CPU, it takes 20 hours. So again, you know why people use GPUs for deep learning? Because it, this is a really efficient processing unit for the kind of work that deep learning does. So we'll install the second geospatial application. Here we are using an image that I had exported from Earth Engine. So you can use Earth Engine images. You can use any other GeoTIFF file that you have. So if you want to do some segmentation, export the image from Earth Engine on a cloud storage or download that locally and you can upload that or you can just load the drive. So if you have data in your drive, you can actually mount the Google Drive here. So if you come to Colab, that is a here mount drive. So you can read data from your drive also. So wherever your data is, drive, local machine. If your data on local machine, you can upload the file to here or you can use it from cloud storage. I had exported my image to cloud storage and we're going to use that. The idea here is we have an image which is central pivot irrigation farms. So we want to detect circular farms from an image. So here's the, an example of the kind of farms that we want to detect. So here's what an NDVI image, it's a Landsat image, NDVI looks like. What we want to know is we want to know, detect boundaries of all the farms. This is a very hard problem to do with the classification because what do you consider a farm? Something that is, you know, circular, you need to detect shapes, very hard for a traditional classification. But for objects, you can see there are so many objects. The objects are all this. One note is when you're using the segmentation models, they only work with RGB data. So you need to take your data, colorize it, and it only works with three band information. So you need to select the three bands that you want, colorize it, and export it. So here we just have NDVI one band, we colorize it using the palette, and then export the data as a color image. And we'll take this color image and give it to the segmentation model. So here is the exported image. I'd exported it from Earth Engine to cloud storage, and this is my cloud storage bucket. Let's visualize the image here. If you want to use your own image, you can just upload it here and change the path here, and you'll be able to see the image. If you want to do a segmentation, you have to say, okay, I have to build a model, get millions of training samples, build a model, train it, and then you predict. But since we are using a pre-trained model, we can say, I'll use segmentation, segment geospatial model directly on this image. This library knows how to load the model. So we are downloading the, the model that was trained by Facebook and released as an open source model. So we're just loading that model and we'll say, generate the mask for this. So identify all the objects and show me. And this notebook is largely based on the example notebook that is given there. So again, you don't really need to know much about deep learning. You just need to know how to use this library, load a model, and then load your image and run the model on your image. That's a kind of main skill that is required to do this kind of work. So now my model is available. It's going to take my input image, create a new image segment.tiff, which will have the objects detected from that particular image. And you can see now it's doing the prediction. It's taking the image, running the model on that. And this is the part where if you use a CPU, it's going to take hours to do this. We are using a GPU 
which will take a few minutes and you'll get your answer. So our segmentation is, you can see it identified all the objects. We can also vectorize it. Since this is a geospatial library, it can directly turn this into a shapefile or a geo package and you can just download that. So here we have our output. We have the shapefile that's outputted here. Let me just download it as a geo package. Just makes it easy for me to download. So I'm just saying diff to geo package and it will save my results as the geo package. And now we download this. I can see this in QGIS. You can see I have my segmentation result. This is all the objects. I just need to delete the background. And you can see I have the farm boundaries as polygons. In just one minute, I was able to take an image, send it to segment geospatial, and I have the objects detected. Some a task that was very hard or impossible for most people to achieve. Now, once you know how to use Python and segment geospatial, you can do this. The next notebook that I want to show you, which is the one with the prompting. This one was a, a recent project I worked on where they wanted to extract and monitor mine parameter every week. So you have some mines in a database say, what is the perimeter every week? And I want to do this at scale. How do we do this in Earth Engine? You can extract the images, but then how do you, you know, extract the mine? And again, we should try to do this. You said there are different objects, but I'm only interested in the mines. So let's run this. I'll show the script that we use to export this. I found a really nice database of mines in the community catalog. 74,000 mining polygons, mine polygons globally. So you use that as a reference and say, we have the mines, let's monitor each of them every week. And you first want to create a composite. So we just did a Sentinel-2 composite of that region. And once we have an image, we want to extract the mine parameter. perimeter. So this is what the image looks like. What we want to know is we want to extract the exact perimeter of this mine. Let's try segment geospatial. We take this image, give it to the segmentation model. And what the model would do is it'll say, I have different objects, but we can prompt the model and say, I don't want to extract all the type of objects. I want to identify objects, which are mines. So you can put points here, put point here, put point here and say, these are some samples of stuff that you want, which is foreground. And this is some stuff you want as a background. You can drop those points manually. If you just have one image and you want to do this, you can do easily manually with the package that you have. It allows you to drop points and you'll segment it. How do we do this scale? What I did was I have the polygons, reference polygons. I buffered them inwards and sampled 100 points. I buffered them outwards, sampled 100 points. And now we have the parameter will change slightly, but if you buffer them inwards, you get only mining stuff. That's a foreground. Buffer them outwards, you get some out uh, points which are just non mine. I think I did 10 per image. So, so this is an example of the foreground coordinates and background coordinates. This is how we are prompting the model. This is called prompting in the image space where you say extract the stuff that falls in the foreground, don't extract the stuff that falls in the background. And you can see the image that has a lot of stuff going on. We can't just segment it and otherwise we'll get polygons for everything. Now, once we run this, and we do the prediction, you will see that now you have the, the raster along with the points which were extracted as foreground and background. So you'll only see the data for the foreground extracted as the polygon. Okay, you can see this polygons here. Now we could extract this as polygon, a mining parameter from the image by prompting the segmentation model to say, I know some examples of the stuff I want to extract. And let me just download and show you. Here is a mining parameter. This package I'm um, Geo is amazing. I'm going to show you some other stuff it can do. And again, just to put this in context, people have not done deep learning. If you want a result like this, first you need to get a PhD to know how to do deep learning and then spend maybe years collecting and training data, and then you can get this. And probably what you can do won't be as good as what Facebook did. So instead of doing all the work, you can just call this model and get much better results. Let me show you what the segment special model can do. You come to this website, again, 
Professor Kuisheng, who has developed this, you can take this and identify all objects. You can prompt it. So you can interactively say, I have an image, drop some point in the foreground and background and segment split it into the objects. And you can just do prompt and say, I have some points and I can identify buildings from this. Or this is really cool. You can do text prompts. I have an image, you can say tree and it'll go, it understands what tree is and it just identifies trees. So again, there are a bunch of tutorials and notebooks that you can use for your work.